Hello and welcome to the Shiny Peas Podcast, a podcast for those who like their knitting, comedy and yarn in equally large measures. I'm your host Jo Milmar and this is episode 116, Return to Shetland with Susan Crawford. I feel a need to laugh again with you, if that's alright. Hello, hello, and welcome into episode 116. How are you? I hope you're well since last time I chatted to you. I'm now off in the Far East for the summer. You may have seen via my Insta stories um, that I'm off travelling around Asia. And I've got my little portable recording studio with me as well, so that I can carry on bringing the podcast to you. And there was a plan for a podcast last week, um, but unfortunately I got aeroplane lurgy. You know that horrible aeroplane lurgy that you get when um, you just get germs from the aircon and you get like a cough and a bit of a snotty nose. And I thought the last thing you need is me doing that down the microphone at you. So I rolled it over to this week and now I'm feeling much better and less snotty. (laughs) I'm very excited to be bringing this particular interview to you. Now, Susan has been on the show before. We last met her way back... um, Three years ago, 2015, when she was in episode, I think it was 56 from memory. And she was talking all about her uh, com- uh, her pre-order, pub slush, crowdfunding campaign for her book, Vintage Shetland Project. Now, if you have followed Susan since then, you'll know there was a bit of a plot twist in terms of producing that book and um, Susan's health and everything else. And I don't want to, if you've not heard the story, kind of spoil it too much for you because we do go into the detail of uh, some of that in this episode. So um, we do cover some of Susan's illness. She was uh, diagnosed with stage 3 breast cancer very, very unexpectedly, a very aggressive form. And um, so a bit of a kind of warning for anyone that, um, you know, is going through that or could find listening to any of that difficult. We will talk about some of that in this episode. So you may want to give it a miss for now if it's something you're going to find difficult. But um, assuming you're going to want to carry on and listen to the rest of it, uh, she talks about some wonderful, wonderful stories uh, that are covered in the book during this interview where we're at her lovely farm in Lancashire with a very persistent cockerel outside and tells some of the wider stories and some of the background around doing the project and the story she found out about and the people she met along the way which I thought was super interesting it was a great conversation that I really really enjoyed having with her and I hope you will all enjoy listening to it as well so grab yourselves a brew my friends buckle up and strap in because we will get into this interview with Susan I'm super excited today to have Susan Crawford back on the podcast, coming back after episode 56, I think it was. Golly. <laughs> Which is a little while ago now. Um, and in that episode, you were talking all about Vintage Shetland Project before the book was done. You know, it was all the research was there and you were doing a crowdfunding campaign to... Um, <laughs> That cockerel's going to get right on our nerves, isn't it? Um, Sorry. To do, uh, well, you know, he's only doing what cockerels do. Um, you're doing a crowdfunding campaign to publish that book and get it out there, which feels like quite a long time ago now. And I think it was a, co- a, a couple of years, certainly, at least. Yeah, it was maybe 2015. Two- yeah, so three years now. Yeah. Wow. Um, so today we're going to catch up with you. So welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. It's nice to be back. Yeah, and I can see you know, we're sat in your living room on your beautiful farm in rural Lancashire and and it is lovely it's a beautiful day outside very sunny the sheep are outside bouncing past the window the cockerel is making his presence felt um and we're sat here and there's actually a copy of your book right next to you there on the table there is yes yes and it is glorious I have a copy myself and it is it is a beautiful piece of work thank you really is um so do you want to just tell us a little bit about what you've been up to since last time we talked to you? Right, yeah. Well, <laughs> last time everything was all systems go. We were planning to move forward and get the book finished. Um, 
we had a tremendous response to the crowdfunder, absolutely fantastic and quite quite gobsmacking, to be honest with you. Um, the funds that we've got enabled me to do more research than I had originally intended. Um, and I was in the process of doing that um, when the, I think the summer after we'd had the crowdfunding, I was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer, um, which completely changed the entire sort of approach to the the rest of my life at the time. So I tried carrying on with the book, but really struggled with the whole process um, and had to make the decision to put the book to one side while I focused on treatment and getting better, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, Fortunately, I'm hopefully now out the other side of that episode. And I went back and revisited what I'd done for the book. I must admit, I reapproached a lot of the book mm-hmm. um, and rewrote a s- significant part of it. Um, and then in February of this year, very, very end of February, we finally got it published and it's now ended up as a 472-page um, tome um of stories and patterns and photographs and really shows, I think, a, a journey and a a dedication to getting something finished. And I'm really rather proud of it, to be honest. You should be. You should. And you, you don't really do small books anyway. You're not a small book kind of lady. No. You do <laughs> really chunky. Like you definitely get your money's worth with your books in terms of it's never just a little thin papery book. It's always a solid, beautifully done book. It is. Yeah. I think I realised as well that for me, the book itself is part of the artistic process. It's mm-hmm. actually, it's the outcome, not just the means of sharing that outcome. It in itself is is part of the outcome. So the book has to reflect the effort that's gone into it, the process, I suppose. So the bigger the project, the bigger the book. <laughs> <laughs> No, for sure. And it's, I guess, especially when you're talking about a subject that involves working with your hands and very tactile things, like the, the end result of a tactile product, which is that book, that also has to live up to, you know, higher standards and expectations that makers have because they're used to having beautiful things in their hands. Yeah, I think that's true. Yes. And I think the it needed to be beautiful. The things that are being shared in it are beautiful. Mm-hmm. The stories are on the whole, quite wonderful stories, mm. very positive. The whole thing physically needed to reflect that beauty, I feel. Yeah, for sure. So what? which was your favourite kind of just jumping straight into talking about the project? Because obviously this has been part of your life for... Eight years. Eight years. I was going to say six, but I've clearly lost two <laughs> years somewhere here. Like eight years, it's a long time. You it know? is. Um, it's been a big, big part of your life and you've been involved, um, your family's been involved, there's been people involved all over the country, you know, there's been a lot, a lot of work that's gone into this um, and those stories that you talked about that I think, are, you know, that's a really interesting part of this, the, the knitwear itself by itself is beautiful, but the stories that go with it just add that extra layer of meaning um, and I know what my mother-in-law's favourite one is, um, but what was your favourite story in this book? There are, there are different stories that I particularly love for different reasons, but there's probably, if I have to narrow it down, there's probably two or three that have most significance to me. One was the story of Lisbeth Henry, who is basically a, a missing knitting historian who in the early 20th century, went to Shetland and was the first, or appears to be the first person to have physically written down the stitches Mm -hmm. that the knitters were creating. Um, And I managed to find her body of work, which she had um, bequeathed to a museum in Scotland. And when she bequeathed it, she fully believed that 
that work was going to go on display and was going to be remembered and was going to be used by other people. Um, And also she hoped that it would be turned into a book. Mm -hmm. And that was in the late 1930s. And of course, the um, World War Two came about and all dreams of publication of a knitting history book. Just yeah, no, nobody was interested, obviously. Um, so where dreams were pretty much squashed. Mm-hmm. And that fe- that felt so sad that somebody who had put so much of her own, her own time and effort into it, just like I'd done through circumstances that she had no control over conspired one way or another to basically make her disappear within knitting history Mm. and that seemed so tragic and just so wrong so being able to share more of her story and more of her work has felt really really important Um, and I feel really privileged to have been able to to do that Um, and then there are I would say a couple of others that really strike home with me, but I think the one that for different reasons I really loved was the story of um, Bob Yule's jumper Mm -hmm. and him because up until the 11th hour of publishing the book, I had practically nothing to say. I knew a tiny, tiny little bit that this chap had been a doctor He'd flown in World War Two, and he had a love of this particular sweater. And as a result, it was returned to the museum. Mm-hmm. And they knew nothing else, and I knew nothing else. And then through some strange twists and turns, as these things sometimes happen, um, it transpired that he had retired from being a doctor and had moved to a small seaside village five miles from where we are right this no moment. No way. He passed away, sadly, but his son, who is um, probably in his mid-60s, I think, n- resides only a few miles away from here. I managed to find him. We got in touch, and he has shared his father's life, his love of his sweaters, they travel to Shetland regularly because they also share that same passion. Um, he's a collector of Shetland <laughs> jumpers himself. Um, and they just shared so much about Bob. Photographs of him. They actually had photographs of, of his auntie who had knitted the jumpers. So oh. suddenly we had the person behind the knitting. Mm-hmm. And suddenly why these jumpers meant so much to him really became clear. And they'd been he believed his his lucky talisman that the love that his auntie had knitted into the jumpers stopped him uh dying in in the war basically because he he was flying in um halifax bombers Mm -hmm. and had a very very short life expectancy as a result Mm -hmm. six weeks i think was at one point what it was reduced to Mm -hmm. and he survived four years of active service and he he absolutely believed that it was down to his lucky jumper Mm -hmm. and actually getting to share that story and I've met with his son since and he has a copy of the book and they're just so delighted that they've been able to to share something of Bob's life with a wider audience so Mm. I think that that one has felt really special because I've been able to connect directly with somebody who's involved in that story. Yeah, it's such an interesting story. And like you said, like the, the average life expectancy of air crew in that time was very, very low. Um, and actually, you know, like believing that that jumper is lucky, that that the mindset of that probably did, in, in all honesty to him, keep him out of a lot of trouble that he just firmly believed so much that he would be fine in that jumper that he actually ended up being fine. Yeah. And they were very cold aircraft. So. Well, yeah, the, many of them got hypothermia mm. and he, yeah, he, he was, it's interesting because it's very short and very fitted mm-hmm. and it was designed to be worn under his, um, his boiler suit or whatever he mm. was wearing at the time so that he could have that extra lovely insulating layer of, of wool mm-hmm. to protect him. So, 
No, oh, such a cool story and so yeah. lucky. And it's funny how you think that, as you say, sort of sort of pan out that way. And and the story stories always have a way of finding the way out. I think. And once you start digging around and looking for them, somehow the bits just kind of seem to come together with these kind of research projects. Yeah. And again, if I hadn't have been ill, mm-hmm. I would never have found out about him. Yeah, and the book would be less because of it. Mm. So although being ill is something I would never want to have happened and hope never happens again, there were positive outcomes from it. So it's a, again, it's a very strange world. (laughs) It is, it is. And that was the case with a couple of the stories in the book that actually that extra time that unintentionally came about, um, because you were definitely ready to have that book out in the world when you got ill a couple of things came and and really like really nice stories and really interesting stories that found their way into it that like you said wouldn't have happened otherwise so no no they wouldn't it wouldn't be what it is Mm. without illness yeah which is yeah it's it's a it's a strange strange fact to take to absorb really but Mm. it, it is it is definitely the case it is a better book because of it yeah for sure and you've been quite open about the whole process that you've been through. Um, as you've gone through that, I know people have come back to you and said, oh, I've, I've had the same thing, or I'm going through the same thing. How did that kind of fit into... Oh, it's a really difficult kind of question to word, really, but you obviously find that quite therapeutic to share from, from the way you've done it. Yes, um, I did. How did you kind of reconcile that into your kind of where you were with your brand and the vintage knitwear and everything beforehand um I'm not sure it did reconcile really Mm. to be honest um in some ways it could even be that my business possibly suffered as a result of it but in terms of awareness of what breast cancer does and what the treatment does Mm. I felt that was more important important going into um chemotherapy I had no understanding of what it does either in the short term or most definitely in the long term Mm -hmm. um and there were so many people who after I started to share approached me and were thanking me for shedding a light on it yeah either because they wanted people to understand what it had been like for them but had really struggled to explain what was going on and then other people who had family or friends who were scared to ask questions Mm. but were terrified of what was going to come and they were able to share the information that I was that I in turn was sharing Mm -hmm. with with these people and it was helping them get through it as well so I I did it for my own benefit. Mm. I, I can't lie. I, I, I found it extremely therapeutic to share it. For me, it was almost like a primal scream, just getting this stuff out. Yeah. But the fact that other people also gained from it, or at least had felt that they had something as well that would give them guidance and advice, I think it you know, it worked for it worked for other people too, which is wonderful that at least somebody got something out of what I was going through it felt good that you know maybe you know one other person didn't fall apart when their toenails fell off or Mm. I'm sorry (laughs) or or some other (laughs) unpleasant side effect you know Mm -hmm. so no but it's, it's one of those things you know people don't tell you and it's not common knowledge and actually that you know that is quite scary not knowing so it completely makes sense that, you know, people are like, well, n- n- no one's talking about this and I don't know what to expect. And you sharing some of those aspects that maybe, you know, it's not that lifestyle, really. It's not aspirational. It's not, you know, dreamy, crafty stuff, but it's real and it affects people, so many people. Yeah. Um, and it's important. It is. And I think it. we try so hard I think to project perfection, Mm. all of us, even subconsciously, it happens. And when you're, when you are ill and it is not just 
an internal illness, it also affects how you physically appear. That's really, really hard for, mm. for women. It's it's easy to say, oh, well, just, you know, be tough. And But our, our physical appearance matters to us both individually and also in the wider sphere. Everything is about how we look, how we present, how we style things. Our mm. lives are now public property. Yeah. And I think in some respects that therefore makes it even harder for people when you know their hair falls out or they've got no eyelashes or no eyebrows and so on and so forth and uh, I think we need to stop finding that as unpleasant Mm. as a visual as we probably do now I mean some of the people I've met some of the women I've met who have who have basically hidden themselves away as a result of what they see as physical deformation because of cancer. Mm. It, it's it's so, so sad. It's tragic. And most of the reason they do it is because of things other people have said to them or that the experience they've had of somebody laughing at them or saying they were ugly or something unpleasant. Mm. And that's then impacted on their entire future lives you know so it felt it it it, I felt uncomfortable myself sometimes sharing some of the things that I shared Mm. but underneath I felt very very strongly that it was the right thing to do and that I needed to do it for me and for for everybody else yeah, definitely. And I know we, like, we've had conversations offline about things because you met a, an amazing group of women and we'll, we'll kind of come into that in a minute. But some of the things that people, other people were saying to them and putting on them when they were at the most vulnerable, when they were ill, when they were in fear that they might not survive, when they were dealing with all of this hard work, like you literally could not, could not imagine anyone ever saying, and, and people do it, people do. Um. But you you had your support group and you got together and you made something super creative out of this whole experience with this this amazing group of women who I know you got a lot of kind of strength from and, and you all banded together and you all, you know, kind of worked together on the Knocker Jotter. That's right. Yes. The Knocker Jotter. So tell us about that. So it's an awesome name as well. <laughs> I, I can't claim any responsibility <laughs> for the name. There's, I've been very fortunate where we are that we have a local charity um, who provide an awful lot of support to both cancer sufferers, their families and their their entire support network, whoever mm. that might be. Um, and one of the ladies who works for the local charity Cancer Care uh, came up with the idea of doing some sort of photo shoot where we would show ourselves as we truly are mm-hmm. um so even more than sort of the the slightly coy sort of calendar photographs where people would hold cupcakes in front of their <laughs> boobs and things like this this was a warts and all um sort of photo shoot where we actually showed our scars and the the damage and also then the healing and mm-hmm. the, the the women we'd become and so it's a uh, it is what it says. It's a it's a jotter. It's a notebook that contains um, photographic portraits of each of the ladies who decided to take part, um, and it shows where they've been affected by cancer, basically. So we've got women from um, just going through chemotherapy, so with with no hair, right through to the likes of myself who've had a double mastectomy um, without reconstruction. Then other ladies who've had reconstruction have got scars to bear through that reconstruction as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think a lot of people have found that very, very helpful that they can actually see, well, this is, you know, this is the end result or this is, you know, what will happen. Um, And it's very, very positive. It's a really positive message to show that we are all, complete even if physically we've got bits missing it makes no difference 
and our scars are something to be proud of because our scars are what have saved our lives. So yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And, and there were some awesome stories yeah. included in that that as well. Um, so you've kind of come through the other side. Well, not kind of. You have come through the other side of that, and it is. Ju- is it just over a year since you? Yeah, it got will that be all clear. Yeah, it, well, it'll be a. It, it, I. Ooh, it's not a year yet since I got the all clear, but mm. yeah, I, I. It's over a year since treatment, mm. proper full treatment finished. Yeah, yeah. My um, final part of the treatment finished in November of last mm. year, so it will be coming up to a year soon. Yeah, mm. and you've been busy, as I can see, looking yes. around the farm. <laughs> Very busy since then. Why don't you tell us about all the stuff you're up to right now? Uh, right, well, quite a lot, really. Busy. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we've just finished our lambing season, and mm-hmm. we've had um, a lot of a lot of lovely, very uh, yeah, adventurous young, <laughs> young lambs who are driving our driving us insane, escaping into neighbouring fields quite a lot at the moment. Um, but we've been so we've been doing that. We've been building our flock. Uh, we've also started work finally on some of the the buildings here on the farm to sort of really make it what we set it set out for it to be when we first moved here four years mm. ago um we have proper distribution facilities we have our yarn all here now um we wind a lot of it we band a lot of it we skein a lot of it we can dye it and so on um, and we distribute everything from here so you order a book and it comes from from one of the barns in the farm and mm-hmm. um, what we're also working on at the moment is the next stage which is a physical shop front mm-hmm. um, and classroom and retreat uh, which is what we're hoping later in this year will be up and running and we will have classes and we'll have retreats and we'll have open days and you'll be able to come and meet the sheep and buy the yarn and buy our books and buy our produce from the farm as well. We mm-hmm. have our own produce. We have jam and gin and, well, you don't really need Too anything else, do you? Yeah, I was going to say, I'm, I'm done, yeah. yeah. Um, and so that's basically at the moment, that's what we're behind the scenes, what we're working on is getting the farm to be somewhere where people can come. And really, it's an, it, I believe it's an incredibly restful place. It seems to make people relax mm. almost as soon as they arrive here and I think that's something I would like to to share with people, and it's definitely been a part of my healing process. Mm. Living here has has really, really helped me yeah. come out the other side of things. So I think it just has something about it that does that for people. So that's what we're we're working on. We've got all sorts of ideas for um, different events and activities and so on. So um, that will hopefully be appearing sometime soon so. mm. it is it's, it's in some ways terrible coming here because <laughs> you do just as, as, it's not far off the motorway at all it's not far and you get here and it's almost like time disappears it's like a different time space continuum you just chill out and then you're like oh, it, has it got to four o'clock already gin time anyone yeah it's <laughs> lovely and just so peaceful it is it is yeah it is so easy to get to mm. And yet, as you say, you sort of, I don't know, you almost come over the hill and... Yeah. You, I mean, you can't hear the road at all. No. Know? When you say it's near the motorway, it is near the It's like probably even, not even 10 minutes away from the junction. About, yeah, about just under 10 minutes, yeah. But you, I mean, you can't hear a thing no. other than the, the sheep and the birds and... Um, yeah. Yeah. The cockerel has gone quiet now. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so that's our sort of, that's our, that's our goal is to have this as a a place for people to come and relax and enjoy and share in share in all the good things of Monkley Gill and hopefully buy some yarn and sit and do some knitting and just enjoy it. Yeah, definitely. And there is a beautiful view from from the kind of slope coming down outside across the valley and all the green fields and the pike and, you know, all the little sheep it's just so 
lovely. It is. Like, it's it's a beautiful. That's not the word for it. It's just like it's just lovely. You know. <laughs> I don't. I don't think it's any coincidence that it's it. It was apparently this this little section is one of uh, Turner's favourite places to come mm. and paint, and I think. There's something about the fact that you've got the the Pennines and then you've got the Howgills mm. and things like that all just sort of around you in one direction. Then you've got the coast in the other direction. And if you just, if the light's right, you can see the reflection of the sea. And it's just, it's got everything that you need really all in, all in one place. It's mm. our little piece of heaven, I think. It is. It's lovely. It's got a lovely feeling about it when you come here. Definitely. Really nice vibe. I really like it. Yeah, I, I do. Really like just, it. just, just don't come here when when Gavin's chasing sheep because he's slightly less calm than. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's super calm, isn't he? He's super he is. Calm. He is. That, but the sheep, they're naughty sheep. You have naughty sheep. Mm, we we managed to pick a set. I like I like I like animals with character. <laughs> so we we chose. We we started. We began with Shetland sheep, which for obvious reasons, mm. uh, 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 are my favourite. They're also small and supposedly, you know, that makes them more easy to handle. They are incredible escapologists. They are also very, very naughty. <laughs> they they like to see how far they can push you before mm. you crack. There's no doubt about it. They get great <laughs> delight in teasing us. Um, we've then also got um, some of the only indigenous Lancashire sheep that there are which are called the lonk and mm-hmm. um, which are very very limited to they're not classed as a rare breed because there's plenty of them within the area that they come from mm-hmm. but they are very much only bred sort of from here pretty much across the Pennines and over towards um, about Harrogate way really? and that's sort of and down to Cone and mm. Blackburn and they really don't exist anywhere else outside of that area really Mm -hmm. so they're a very very local sheep um but they are torments as well (laughs) they they're they're another hill breed and Mm -hmm. in their as far as they're concerned walls are meaningless they are they can (laughs) climb anything they can get out of anywhere and they enjoy very much in just seeing how far they can go before you can catch them (laughs) <laughs> but they have lovely fleece and lovely faces and lovely lambs. So I, we put up with it, I'm afraid. <laughs> oh, awesome. Well, thank you for coming back and sharing all of what you've been up to with us. It's very, very exciting times. I'm looking forward to seeing what you've got coming over the next few months at the farm. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been lovely to be back. Cheers. So, how did you find that? Did you enjoy it? I hope you did, as much as I enjoyed having that conversation with her. She's such an interesting lady. And the level of detail and care that have gone into the Vintage Shetland project are uh, unsurpassed. I've not seen anyone in, in at all, to be honest. And I have a lot of books. I'm a bit of a bibliophile. I haven't seen anyone produce a book to the quality standard that she's produced that book. It is heavy. The paper stock is beautiful and it's an absolute delight to own it. And I'm more than happy to have waited the amount of time um, it took to produce it. And very, very glad that uh, Susan has come out the other side of it. And the project actually, I think, is probably better for the uh, detour that that had to happen as a uh, she battled with her illness and the extra information that came to mind as a result of that extra time really it almost felt like it was a way of these stories that were going to come out whether you know we wanted them to or not and it's going to be something that I'm going to kind of look at in more detail and review and talk about in another episode and probably a blog post because you really do need the pictures uh, to do that book justice But if you want to go and find out anything about Susan and about the Vintage Shetland Project, um, it's all at susancrawfordvintage.com. And of course, as always, I will have links in the show notes for you at shinybees.com forward slash 116 for this episode for you to link through directly to her. 
So that's all I've got time for today. I hope you've enjoyed the show. I will be back with you in a few days with some new episodes and such like for you. And um, some stories. I've got some interesting stories already from our our travels in, uh, in, in the Far East. Including one particularly scary moment where I had to stop an entire marching column of riot police. Oh yes. It continues. So you can look forward to that on the next one. And I'm hoping to be sharing some more images with you over on my Insta stories. I have a thing about um, funny English translations. I really love um, literal translations on signs. It it provides me no end of amusement. Not in a snotty way, just in a, this makes me laugh. It's a great thing to have our own way. Uh, As well as other cool stuff that I see. And hopefully there will be some video as well soon. I'm still working on the finer points of of getting all that to work because it's a little bit dingy with the air pollution so I'm probably going to need some some more tech some more kit but Taobao has everything I require and every bit of kit I've ever bought has been manufactured here anyway so I'm sure it's all going to be fine so until then take care and I will speak to you all again soon cheers to the Shiny Bees podcast. All show notes for this episode can be found over at my website at shinybees.com forward slash 116. Music for this episode is provided by Adam and the Walter Boys with I Need a Drink, available on iTunes. Links in the show notes. To laugh again with you, if that's all right.